Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish botanist living in the 18th century. He had studied medicine at the University of Uppsala in Sweden up till the 1730s, but his real passion rather than medicine was botany, and he was very talented at it, so much so that his professors gave him a teaching post while he was still an undergraduate. Um, he hadn't even finished his degree and he was already working as a professional botanist. After leaving Uppsala a few years later, he moved to the Netherlands to complete his studies. And the Netherlands at that time was a really important center for botany and horticulture. So Carl Linnaeus was, was uh, a botanist who was surrounding himself by other botanists and trying to live in the key centers of botany at that time. Carl Linnaeus came from a province in Sweden called Småland. Uh, his ancestors had lived there for several generations, and several generations before he was born, there was a, a tree growing in the village where his family lived that was considered to have magical powers. It was a linden tree, and it had three trunks. Uh, and at that time in Sweden, most people didn't have surnames as such. They often had sort of patronymics, so they would use their father's name as, as a surname, but they didn't have formal surnames. But around this time in the 18th century, surnames were beginning to become more common. And the villagers in this in this little area were choosing surnames for themselves. And several of them took names based on this magical linden tree that grew in the in their in their village. So one man chose the name Tiliander, I think, which it comes from the Latin name for the linden tree. But another one called himself Lindelius. And one man called himself Linnaeus, or Linnae at the time. Ah, oh, Linnaeus is the Latinized version. And that man was the father of the man who went on to become Carl Linnaeus, the famous Swedish botanist. So his name came from a tree and he later went on to become world famous for naming other trees. So it's, there's a nice circularity to that. So Carl Linnaeus invented a system called the Linnaean system, which was used to group plants into certain families. And the system was based on the premise that plants, like animals, had sexes. This was a theory that was still being debated at that time, but Linnaeus ignored the debate and decided to use it for practical purposes. The system was what is called an artificial system because it uses just one part of the plant to group the whole species. For example, Linnaeus chose to use the flower as the central part of his system and he completely ignored a plant's stems or leaves or roots, so therefore it's called artificial. Linnaeus knew this was an artificial system, but it still had a lot of practical use, so he didn't mind. The system was based around a plant's flower because Linnaeus thought that the flower was the center of plant sexuality. He said that the number and arrangement of the so-called male and female parts of the flower, uh, nowadays what we would call the stamen or the pistil, were used to define taxonomic groups. For example, flowers with one stamen made up the first class, this was called monandria, Flowers with two stamens uh, made up the second class, which was called diandria, and so on. And then these classes were subdivided into orders based on the number of pistils. The first order was made up of flowers with a single pistil that was called monogynia, and each subsequent order was made up uh, or contained an additional pistil. And the, the naming continued in the, using those Greek names, mon, di, and so on. Um, it's a very simple system because Unlike a lot of other systems, you don't have to have lots of expensive apparatus or lots of expensive reference books, and it made botany very accessible to ordinary people. You really just had to be able to count in order to classify plants according to the Linnaean system. You didn't need to speak Greek or Latin, you didn't need to have studied at university. Um, so suddenly a whole bunch of people who hadn't been involved in science before, especially women, became involved in botany because of the way Linnaeus simplified it. It was also very useful for all of the species that were coming into Europe from the rest of the world at that time as European ex empires were expanding and the system spread really quickly across Europe and was particularly popular in England. So Carl Linnaeus published two particularly important books. He published a lot of books but I'm just going to talk briefly about two of them. The first was called Systema Naturae which means the system of nature and that was published in 1735. When it was first published, in the first edition, it only contained 11 pages, so it was extremely small. It went through dozens of editions in Linnaeus' lifetime and, and dozens more afterwards. Um, by, the, by the end of the 18th century, it was hundreds of pages long. But in the first 11-page version of Systema Naturae, Linnaeus very simply outlined the sexual system of plant classification 
which was a system in which you simply had to count the stamens and pistils within a plant's flower and you could use those to group all plants in the world into particular species or families. Linnaeus also published a second book which was very important called Species Plantarum. He published this about 20 years after he had published The System of Nature in 1753. This book is important for a few reasons. For one thing, it was the first scientific book in the world that used binomial nomenclature. This was a system of naming that Linnaeus had specialised for naming living creatures, and it used a genus name and a species name. For example, with humans we call them homo, homo sapiens, or uh, with plants you might use a name like um, Daonia muscubulia, um, which was also known as the Venus flytrap. Uh, so that was one important thing that Species Plantarum did. The second thing it did was describe every plant species known to Linnaeus at that time. So it was, in his view, completely comprehensive. Uh, and one of the first books that really described the whole of a single kingdom, which was an incredible feat for the time, and quite difficult also at a time when European empires meant that new species were being discovered all the time. Linnaeus changed everything really because <laughs> he instigated a break from medicine, from herbalism. Um, previously botany had been taken, well, you know, most of the women that had been involved previously in botany were sort of herbalists, shall we say, were involved in the medical properties of plants and investigating that. Um, and Linnaeus, I guess, instigated a break from that. Um, and so he developed his own system for classifying plants, the sexual system where plants were classified according to the number of stamens and pistils, the male and female parts of the flower. Um, this was also, of course, um, in many ways, um, fairly risque because uh, <laughs> there was a lot about uh, sexual union, for example. Um, and so botany, it changed the face of botany, you know, completely in terms of its reception. Um, and. In England, it, it, it was mixed because there was a fascination with Linnaeus. In many ways, he, um, he represented order because it, it was taking plants out of their natural habitat and placing them within a universal system. Um, and that represented kind of order and regularity, so many people embraced that. And yet, with the terminology and with the idea of the sexual system, um, it also offered something that um, that could, you know, challenge the laws of propriety ultimately. Um, and so there was a hesitation there as well. So there's this, you know, interesting kind of dual attitude towards Linnaeus. But obviously people like Erasmus Darwin, um, they pretty much celebrated Linnaeus and they set up the um, Botanical Society at Litchfield, which was, uh, the sole purpose of which was to translate the works of Linnaeus into English uh, and to kind of spread, spread those ideas in some way. Darwin's um, introduction describes the Linnaeus, Linnaeus's categories in great detail, and the important thing is that class, there are classes and orders of plant decided by the, their flower, and the classes are decided by the number of pistils and the number of stamens in the flower. Most flowers have one pistil and a certain number of stamens, but there are enough that have a few pistils to, for there to be a kind of an interesting variety there. Uh, Darwin sets up, in a sense, in Loves of the Plants, an expectation that he will move in a very sort of direct way from the first flower, Kanna, the Indian lily, which has one stamen and one pistil, but he will slowly move through more and more complex ones. As you get through the poem, actually, you discover he's interested in all sorts of other things, and that rather rigid stamen counting structure rather falls apart. But we certainly start off thinking that that's what's happening. And so it's very clear why we're starting with the canna. One pistol, one stamen. And he kind of presents them rather as a sort of a good monogamous couple with the... the, 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 the Stamen looking after the pistol as a, as a good husband should. But I suppose his idea was rather than um, in some ways shying away from the sexual system, was to really kind of celebrate it, to make it accessible, um, but also to um, 
in some ways engage not only with science but with literature to create this kind of hybrid text which introduces people to the Linnaean system in a really um, compelling and accessible way by showing uh, the sexual unions through, um, through metaphor. Um, so he was influenced by Ovid, obviously classical writers, who'd used uh, the idea of metamorphosis and the idea of um, changing, uh, changing shape in some way, but he wanted to use botany as the basis of his poem, but, but kind of draw on that kind of Ovidian metamorphosis in some way. Um, so he would celebrate the sexual unions of the flowers and he wouldn't shy away from the fact that many of these were not monogamous, for example, and so there were many, uh, many forms of sexual union in the plant world and very few of them were actually monogamous. So they weren't just, you know, um, kind of chaste versions of flowers. If anything, he went out of his way to celebrate the ones <laughs> that were the most promiscuous. Mm -hmm.